Now on BBC One at 10 o'clock, the news with Fiona Bruce and Assad Ahmed. Labour count the cost of their first by-election defeat in 15 years. The Liberal Democrats achieve a record swing with victory in Brent East. We'll be assessing the lessons for Labour and the Conservatives as they were relegated to third place. Also tonight, police recommend no prosecutions over the deaths at Deep Cut Barracks. We're the worst binge drinkers in Europe, so says the government. The mother of the seven-year-old shot in the back tells us of her anguish. And in BBC London news, they terrorised a housing estate. Now a gang of yobs is banned by the courts. And the illegal racers still putting lives at risk after the death of an off-duty police officer. Good evening. Labour admitted today voters have lost enthusiasm for the government as the party reflected on its first by-election defeat in 15 years. The Liberal Democrats are celebrating a record swing of almost 30% to win Brent East. They came from third place at the last general election to top the poll with more than 8,000 votes. Labour was more than 1,000 votes behind and the Conservatives were back in third place. The turnout was a relatively low 36%. Our chief political correspondent Mark Mardell reports. She's obviously well brought up. Say thank you very much. Britain's newest and at 29 youngest MP spent tonight saying her thank yous to the voters of Brent. Sarah Tether has given an almighty jolt to the government, delivering New Labour its first defeat of this sort. There's a complete lack of trust in Tony Blair now. And because of that lack of trust, people don't believe him when he talks about being able to deliver on local hospitals and local schools. Of course, winning stunning by-election victories is something of a Lib Dem stock in trade. So does it mean anything? There is nothing more definitive in politics than the public speaking. And when they speak in such dramatic fashion as they did in the Brent East parliamentary by-election, governments and the political establishment as a whole have to sit up and take note. I hereby declare... At the declaration, among the usual colourful characters, gloomy Labour faces, the party says it's listening. We accept that result, but we're going to get our sleeves rolled up and make sure by the next election, whether you're in Brent, whether you're in Bolton, Newcastle, wherever you live in Britain, you get the improvements in the public services, we promise you. Pushed into third place, the Conservatives. But this is not natural Conservative territory. What we see in Brent East and the story of the election result is a devastating blow to Tony Blair in one of Labour's core heartland seats. In Brent, the voters are consistent about why there's been a change. I think it's partly to do with um, Tony Blair um, not saying the truth and not coming out with the truth. I think it's definitely to do with the war, without a doubt. Um, and basically the services here haven't improved while they've been in power. Labour freely admit that Iraq was a big issue here. Many local party members wouldn't campaign for them because of it. And the issue of trust in the Prime Minister was constantly raised on the doorstep. Still, defeat came as a big shock. This is a party that's grown used to winning. Labour's been on a winning streak for a while. The last by-election they lost was Govan 15 years ago. Tony Blair was elected as a leader because he looked like a winner. And of course, he was, delivering the 1997 landslide victory after 18 years in the wilderness and then a historic term in 2001. But has all that come to a halt? We are in deep trouble. And for the first time, one sees the prospect that we might actually lose an election on a record low turnout. As the losers peel off the petals from their campaign headquarters, Labour is thinking very hard about how to freshen up its campaigning and regain trust. Mark Mardell, BBC News, Brent. Well, let's talk now to Mark Mardell, who's in Downing Street. Mark, the Home Secretary, David Blunkett, said today this result showed that voters had lost enthusiasm for the government. What lessons have Labour got to learn from this? I think they're very well aware indeed that Iraq, the debate over Iraq, has been so noisy, so loud, that it's drowned out everything else. And they've got to find a way round over under this so they can talk about schools and hospitals. And then they think trust will come back if they're seen to deliver on those things. But I think more than this, Tony Blair, if he's loved at all by the Labour Party, is loved because he's a winner. Now, I'm not saying this by-election is part of the beginning of a trend, because we just don't know that. But last night, he created a political atmosphere. He created a political atmosphere that last night led to their defeat. Now, that will make people more willing to question him, to ask whether he's going in the right direction. And that will be difficult for him. Mark, what about the Conservatives? There's scant comfort in today's result for them. 
Well, Ian Duncan Smith is making a speech tomorrow. He's trying to try to turn everything on, his, on its head. He's saying that these people in Brent who elected the Lib Dems, they elected Red Ken throughout the 80s, so the Lib Dems are a left-wing party. All right, he's hinting for the inner cities, but not for the market towns of England. So he's, you know, nice try there, but it's still true that uh, a ma the major opposition party ought to be uh, in a position to garner those votes if people are unhappy with the government. It's not good for him. OK, Mark, thanks very much. We're the biggest binge drinkers in Europe, and it's costing our economy billions of pounds. That's according to a new government report on drinking habits in England and Wales. We're drinking more than double the amount we did 50 years ago, and it's a particular problem among young people. Summer, 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 Reading's summer, new summer, nighttime summer, economy summer, is thriving. Never before have there been so many pubs and clubs or so much drinking. How much have you been drinking tonight? I only had one pint. Eight pints, maybe. That's that's called binge drinking. That's not good for your health. Does that worry you? Binge drinking. Yeah, but the thing is, I I, I don't go out like uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Well, Thursday I do go out because that's <laughs> tonight. It didn't take us long last night to see what today's report was all about. Nearly half all men, it says, nearly a quarter of all women have become binge drinkers, downing more than four pints or a bottle of wine in a session. This is apparently typical of many other places. The report says there's an increasing culture of intoxication. Underage binge drinking is getting worse and there's growing evidence it's doing long-term damage to our society. It's costing the economy an estimated £20 billion a year through alcohol-related crime, health costs and through the 17 million working days lost through drinking. There's a can that red, that shark stuff, and then a load of whatever. The biggest increase is amongst 18 to 24-year-olds, and it's all extra revenue for the drinks companies and the treasury. As a nightclub operator, our doors are getting a lot later. So people are coming in sort of when the pubs kick out, closer to 11 o'clock. Uh, they're drinking a lot more before they come to the clubs, and the age group is getting a lot younger. The report warns binge drinking is damaging the nation's health. Drink-related illnesses tie up one in 26 hospital beds. There are 22,000 drink-related deaths a year. And there's the clear-up cost of street crimes due to drink and extra policing. Here in Reading, the council believes the expense is worth it when offset against the revenue from clubs. But the government wants a different approach, a shift to continental cafe-style drinking over a meal or with the family and get a range of people into our city centres so that older people uh, can feel that they can have a night out as well. And that's a moderating influence sometimes on young people's behaviour where they've got a wider range of people to mix with. The trouble is they haven't yet worked out how to achieve this. Tonight, alcohol-related charities said what's needed is action, along with extra cash for a massive anti-drink campaign. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News, Reading. A police investigation into the deaths of four young recruits at Deep Cut Barracks has found no evidence that their deaths were suspicious. But in a report today, Surrey Police did conclude there were failings in the way the army deals with vulnerable young recruits. The families of the four who died have always refused to accept that the soldiers killed themselves and are calling for full public inquiry. The Princess Royal Barracks in Deep Cut, for 15 months the subject of an investigation by Surrey Police. More than 900 witnesses, two ballistics reports, a million pounds of taxpayers' money, and still no answers. The police have amassed a wealth of evidence, but the four deaths at Deep Cut may never be properly explained. James Collinson died in March last year. Six months earlier, Jeff Gray was found with two gunshot wounds to the head. And eight years ago, two other deaths, privates Sean Benton and Cheryl James. The police have found no credible evidence of foul play, but they do have harsh words for the army. By investigating these deaths in the way we have, which was probably the biggest investigation ever of incidents of this nature on army establishments, we've revealed some very significant gaps in the care regime for young soldiers. The police report lists a catalogue of recommendations for the army, from the supervision of young, sometimes vulnerable soldiers to stricter controls on access to firearms. The Surrey police and the army have already agreed 27 separate lessons that need to be learned, but this is still a damning document. Many of those lessons were first identified as long ago as 15 years. 
No great comfort today for the deep cut families. For some, a sense of resignation. I think the time has come now to move on. I think we're going to have to accept that we're never going to know what happened to James that night. Not 100% sure. And um, let's just hope for a public inquiry. But that's not what the Surrey police are calling for. They only favour a broad look at ways of avoiding similar tragedies in the future. And the government says it's doing that already. I have taken some very firm action in the last year and a half to address some of the key issues that have come out of those deaths. And we're implementing them progressively now and in the months ahead. This is not the end of the deep cut story. The Surrey coroner must now decide what action he wants to take. Plenty of people still looking for answers. Paul Adams, BBC News. The mother of seven-year-old Tony Ann Byfield, who was gunned down with her father in North London last week, has been speaking about her daughter's killing. Rosalyn Richards, who lives in Jamaica, sent Tony Ann to Britain for a better life. She's been speaking exclusively to our correspondent, Daniel Sanford. It's almost six days now since Tony Ann Byfield was killed, shot in the back in London after witnessing her father's murder. Here in Jamaica, her mother has spoken publicly for the first time about her daughter's tragic death. Tony Ann looks so pretty in the paper. She's just a baby. Why would someone so wicked I'm going to spare our life. In the Jamaican capital, Kingston, news of the girl's murder has shocked a population used to death. Kingston can be a dangerous city. It has one of the highest murder rates in the world. So it's particularly tragic that a little girl who left here for a better life in Britain ended up brutally murdered in a London bedsit. Her mother made this appeal. Please help the police. I know God always leave a witness, someone saw. She's a baby, please. The British detectives hunting Tony Ann's killer have come to Kingston to interview the family. Seeing the heartache um, personally with uh, uh, Rosalind, the mother, um, it, I, it just is unspeakable um, what she must be going through. In the full glare of the media, Tony Ann's two brothers are being comforted by their mother, who hopes to travel to London next week to see her dead child for the last time. Daniel Sanford, BBC News, Kingston, Jamaica. And still to come on tonight's programme, the American TV companies considering buying up ITV. The folk singing Welsh nationalist blazing a trail for independence. It's five months since British troops took control of southern Iraq. The people there are mainly Shia Muslims who were hostile to Saddam and many initially saw the British as liberators. But now there's a growing sense of frustration. Many now feel it's time they're allowed to run their own lives. From the British-controlled zone in southern Iraq, Fogel Keane reports. It feels like an idea whose time has come. These Iraqis have arrived to vote for the first time in their lives. Just a local election, but a real taste of freedom. I never thought I'd live to see this, says the policeman. The crowd breaks through. All this for the right to choose their leaders. 26 candidates, 6,000 voters. This may be chaotic, it may be disorganised, but what you do sense here is a powerful desire on the part of Iraqis to run their own lives and their own country, and that can't be contained indefinitely. The coalition forces organised this vote. They know pressure is building. If we move too quickly, there will be uh, a degree of chaos, uh, and a dangerous degree of chaos. The political parties here are, are the remnants of the armed resistance groups to Saddam, uh, and they still think of violence, weaponry, as being part of a political process. We went to find the Badr Corps in Basra, the main Shia militia. They guard the mosques, fearful of attack by other armed groups. Everybody is searched. Their leader said people were tired waiting for their lives to improve. 
شدة الضغط تؤدي إلى الانفجار. What I can say that if if the pressures will continue as they are, they will lead to as an explosion. So these newly arrived troops from the Royal Green Jackets face a serious challenge. Armed uprising is unlikely, but popular anger over the lack of services and rising crime will test them. In the desert, though, not far from the camp, is a reminder of the cost of war here. A memorial to British and Commonwealth dead. Many died in World War I, but others in the Shiite rebellion that followed. We are in a dangerous business, but one that's not without hope. And, uh, you know, we do have a chance to make a difference now. Aware of the danger, the army doesn't want a prolonged occupation. History has its warning for any who stay too long. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Basra. Tony Blair will meet the French President Jacques Chirac and the German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder in Berlin tomorrow to try to patch up their differences over Iraq. They were two of the most outspoken European critics of the decision to evade Iraq. Our correspondent Alan Little is in Berlin. Alan, first of all, how big are the differences now between the three countries? Well, there are two outstanding differences. What they agree on, if we can start with that, is that uh, this has become a matter of urgency for all of them, not just for Britain and America, but for uh, France and Germany as well. So there is a determination to try to come up with a plan that they can all sign up to. The trouble is they disagree on the timetable. The French say they want a restoration of Iraqi sovereignty within a month. The Americans and the British say that's hopelessly unrealistic. It's possible that they could reach some kind of agreement on that. The trouble is they also disagree on the question of under whose auspices should the return of Iraqi sovereignty take place. The French say they want the United Nations to oversee that process. They'll see that as legitimate uh, and not the occupying, what they call the occupying forces. And the British and the Americans, of course, say it will take place under what they call the coalition provisional authority. In other words, under American and British leadership. And it's hard to see how, uh, with one meeting, they can even begin to close that gap. So what chances then, Alan, do you think, of, of finding common ground tomorrow? Well, they're already saying, all sides are already saying, please don't think of this as a formal summit. Please don't think we're even going to start talking about redrafting the resolution for the United Nations. But the, the United Nations uh, General Assembly is meeting next week. There's a big donors conference for Iraq in Madrid next month. And so the timetable is already in place. It is now a matter of extreme urgency. But I fully expect to be standing here this time tomorrow, Fiona, and saying to you, the, the dialogue began today. Part of Tony Blair's responsibility as, the, as far as the French and the Germans are concerned is to bring George Bush on board, to deliver George Bush to an agreement. We're still a long way from that. And I fully expect to be standing here tomorrow saying they've started talking, but they're still a long way from an agreement. OK, Alan, thanks very much. Last night, we heard how unions fear 200,000 British jobs could be under threat from overseas where labour is cheaper. So far, India has gained most from British job losses. But increasingly, it's not just factory and clerical jobs which are going there. Well-paid city jobs are also beginning to move. Our economics editor, Evan Davis, reports on the implications for the jobs market here. You've heard about imported manufactured goods, vacuum clean factories moving to Asia. You've heard about British jobs at call centres moving overseas. You might think that some of our most accessible jobs are being stolen. Jobs in factories or in call centres. But now there's evidence that some of the most highly paid, highest skilled activities are moving offshore. Mumbai, formerly Bombay. Four and a half thousand miles from the UK. Outside, the streets may be untidy, but inside, the offices could be anywhere. Okay, for future, yes, yeah. So, Preeti okay. Kambata exemplifies okay. India's new service workers, part of a team of financial analysts doing contract work for a British company. The research done here ends up in reports published for British investment banks. It's a relatively new form of trade in number crunching. We generally are talking to each other on the emails, and sometimes if it is very urgent, then they just pick up the call. We just talk on the phone or things like that, so that you know there is no time wasted in uh, uh, you know giving the data. Like in London, the man who sends the research work to Mumbai says outsourcing research to India makes perfect commercial sense. It costs about 
20th of the similar cost to do the same work in London. Uh, of course, by the time you add on quality control and the various levels of supervision, uh, it increases, but it's still a tenth of the cost for similar work produced here in London. He's not alone in noticing that. Bigger companies have opened or have plans to open offices in India. In the last couple of decades, unskilled workers have had a relatively hard time in the labour market. After all, it's been low-paid jobs that have moved to low-income countries, if anything, making them lower paid still. Skilled workers have done rather well. After all, their jobs have stayed at home and they've had access to nice, cheap imports. But now, it seems, India can compete with our posh jobs too. India is a very large middle class. India, on the strength of that middle class, is also becoming a very large knowledge resource. As a result of which, as against compared to a country like China, which is becoming the global factory, we are becoming a country which is providing some of the best and the cheapest services to the world. It is a Singapore-based company.